Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, Barnaby, very much for the introduction um, and for the invitation to speak. Uh, really happy to be participating um, in economics. I'm also extremely bummed. I can't be there in person. I had my plane ticket. You know, I had my hotel, um, but sort of just COVID went through my whole family over the past week, week and a half or so. So international travel was just was going to be totally impossible. So I was really looking forward to meeting a lot of you um, in person. Very disappointed I can't be there, but. I'm glad I still get some time to, to chat about EFP 1559. And, and like Barnaby said, I've tried to keep the talk short um, so that if people want to have sort of longer, you know, what more wide ranging discussions, there'll be some time for that. Also, obviously, I mean, you know, any, you, you know, you should feel free to reach out in general in the future, you know, by email or Twitter DMs or whatever. Um, if there's stuff you want to discuss, um, obviously, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to chat through scientific ideas with the sort of the broad community. Okay, so um, I titled the talk Mechanism Design for Ethereum and Beyond. I will talk, talk largely about EIP 1559 in particular, but I still, you know, just for sort of context, you know, I, I thought it might be good to situate the work that's being done on, on the analysis of EIP 1559 sort of in a broader context, specifically in the context of uh, mechanism design. So what's mechanism design? What's well, it's a very old field, uh, you know, over half century old um, part of microeconomics. And, you know, broadly, it, it, it studies a very, you know, general problem, which is if you're trying to make a good decision, or if you're good in some sense means like, you know, best collectively for everybody, how can you do that when you don't even know what good means, meaning you don't in advance know actually what people prefer, what they, what they want. And so the reason this is a hard problem is because you have to sort of do two things simultaneously. Um, you have to simultaneously figure out people's preferences, what it is they want, and then also figure out the decision you're going to make, you know, based on those preferences. And of course, the concern is that given that you're simultaneously getting preferences and making a decision based on them, you worry that participants uh, in your mechanism may try to manipulate your decision by, by misrepresenting their preferences. And at this level of generality, this covers all kinds of stuff. Right, so in particular, you know, the design of a voting system in a DAO would be totally a mechanism design problem in this sense. Now, there's a there's a special class of mechanism design problems, which is going to be what we're interested in, which is the allocation of scarce resources. Okay, where you've got stuff, people want it, um, you don't have enough for everybody, so you have to sort of allocate it in some quote unquote optimal way. You have to figure out who gets the scarce resource uh, and who doesn't. And so this is a special case of mechanism design here. The preferences are just, you know, something like how much are people willing to pay to have the resource or how valuable is the resource to them? And the decision you're trying to make is just, you know, how are you going to allocate that, that scarce resource? And, um, you know, this, this type of mechanism design, you, you see examples of it all the way up and down, you know, the blockchain stack. So, you know, we're going to be talking about the lowest layer, layer one, the consensus layer, that's where that's, that's where you see transaction fee mechanism design. But this is this, there's interesting work to be done here, all up and down. So, for example, you know, layer two, thinking about transaction fee mechanisms there and how they interact with layer one, um, and then sort of most obviously, frankly, at the application layer, there's just sort of a zillion canonical applications of mechanism design, right? Like if you're designing sort of an NFT marketplace or you know some other kind of marketplace, very squarely a, a mechanism design problem. And so what's kind of what's what's sort of super fun, uh, you know, about Ethereum and sort of the blockchain space more generally for kind of a lifelong mechanism design nerd like me um, is how prevalent these opportunities are, right? Because for a contrast, like think of the internet, right? So for the internet, obviously the application layer, there's like lots of sort of opportunities for mechanism design, right? Like you're designing Upwork or some kind of two-sided market. It's clearly a mechanism design problem. But you know, in the plumbing, like beneath the application layer, mechanism design has not really influenced the internet, right? So like the you know BGP routing, and you know, does not use a mechanism design approach for picking routes, or TCP/IP does not use a mechanism me mechanism design approach to think about congestion control. So somehow, you know, in, in blockchains like Ethereum, you actually see mechanism design embedded even at the sort of the lowest, most primitive level, which is just sort of really, really, really fun, really cool. Okay, um, so. Allocation of scarce resources. Hopefully, it's clear to everybody here what is the scarce resource. <laughs> the scarce resource is just, you know, getting a share of the computation being done by the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, so, ignoring, you know, sort of scalability solutions. If you're just talking about layer one, um, right? We're talking about, you know, one block every 13 seconds or so. Current block size 15 million gas, at least on average. You know, so that's maybe, you know, a, a couple, you know, it's maybe sort of 10, 20 ballpark transactions per second, something like that. 
And I think, well, you know, demand sort of comes and goes, but I think we're all well aware that it tends to be much higher than that. On a good day, demand is higher than supply. On a bad day, demand is really, really, really higher than supply. And um, so that means we have a scarce resource, sort of just a Ethereum block space. Uh, and again, you know, we don't have enough for everybody who, who should get access to that resource, what should be the people for whom it's the most valuable. And so that's really the point of a, of a transaction fee mechanism. That's, that's why use, that's why there's a usage fee for a congested blockchain uh, like Ethereum. The, the protocol has no idea, and remember the sort of general sort of problem mechanism design, you don't know in advance people's preferences, you don't know in advance what people are willing to pay. So you need to elicit that information so that you can privilege the sort of high value transactions and allowing transactions to express a bid or a fee is a way for high value transactions to differentiate themselves. I'm gonna to prove to you I'm high value by offering to sort of, you know, basically pay this much to have my transaction <coughs> executed. And so one kind of, <coughs> you know, Econ 101 um, observation, but that's just really important to remember is that, you know, it may well be that, you know, congested blockchain like Ethereum generates an enormous amount of transaction fees and we'll talk later about where those transaction fees go, but it's generating a ton of revenue in that sense. Um, but it's not because it's, you know, it's not because it's, a, that's not inconsistent with it being a public good. Okay, it's not, it's not because the design is to maximize anybody's profit. It's literally just an inevitable consequence of having a scarce resource and wanting to allocate it in, the, in an economically efficient manner. That just will automatically generate revenue whether you wanted it or not. Okay. All right, so that's, that's, mechanism design at layer one as manifested in, in transaction fee mechanisms. Okay, scarce resources is block space. We want a mechanism to figure out which are the highest value <coughs> transactions. So <clears throat> this should sound like, you know, mechanism design 101. Okay, at least if you, if you don't think about it too hard, it feels like you should be able to, you know, pick up a book, you know, maybe one of my books or some other book and just sort of on page 17, read some sort of off the shelf solution that can do exactly this, okay? And um, what's really, one of the things that's been really fun about working on blockchains is that they have a bunch of unique idiosyncrasies, which really mechanism designers have never had to grapple with before. So you really get, even for seemingly super basic problems, you get fundamentally new research questions because of the constraints imposed by the, by the blockchain setting. So let me just sort of spell those out <laughs> here on this slide. So this is what makes this really interesting uh, mechanism design. So challenge zero is sort of not a new challenge. That's just this issue that <clears throat> people can uh, misrepresent their preferences. So in our context, that would mean submitting a, a bid or a transaction fee, which is something different than what would be a, a truthful bid. What would be the, your maximum willingness to pay? And this is exactly the challenge that is actually handled by the textbook solutions. But you know, in public blockchains, you have to make much weaker trust assumptions. So in particular, in traditional mechanism design, you trust that the mechanism is going to be run correctly okay, by somebody, for example, by you know, the government or some trusted third party. And um, in effect, these, you know, in, 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 the, in the public blockchain, the, you know, these decisions are being made by a block producer. Right? So it depends on the exact sort of consensus mechanism, but let's say in sort of basic longest chain, right? every block is really a unilateral um, you know, kind of, uh, it's dictated unilaterally by whoever has the privilege of producing that block. So you can, as a mechanism designer, come up with some mechanism that you'd really love for black producers to actually carry out, but there's no way that they just do not have to do that. They can do whatever they want. And in general, one thinks of black producers typically as just maximizing their own profit. And if they can get higher profit by messing around with your mechanism, we should assume that they are will do that. Let me skip the second challenge, actually. Um, so the third challenge is similar, is sort of <clears throat> another aspect of the first one which is in addition to you know, block producers being able to choose who gets included, who gets excluded, they can also, you know, for example, fabricate their own transactions okay, and include them in the block, okay, which you know, for things like sort of uh, you know, MEV, you know, we've, we've seen lots of examples of why miners might do that. Um, this is also the reason, challenge number three here, this is also the reason why you know, if you've only taken, if you've taken a first course in mechanism design, your automatic thought for these kinds of scarce allocation um, uh, problems is uh, like a second price auction, or the BCG mechanism. Um, and it's exactly this challenge that makes those just completely untenable. So the reason you basically never hear about second price auctions or ascending auctions or the BCG mechanism in a, in a blockchain context 
It's because those really require sort of trust on who's carrying out the mechanism. And in particular, they're very easy to manipulate. Um, so for example, to boost the sort of the seller's revenue or the miner's revenue through the inclusion of sort of just fabricated transactions. So that already rules out kind of a lot of the traditional solutions. And then finally, and this is, this is really, I'd say a broad theme in, what, in sort of what's different in traditional mechanism design applications and what you see in blockchain applications, which is, which is collusion. So in traditional mechanism design settings, where you might have, you know, sort of a, a government of a nation sort of, you know, running some big auction to sell wireless spectrum licenses, um, you don't generally worry that much about collusion, at least not within the mechanism itself, right? Because if you're the government running that auction, you can basically make it illegal. I mean, you just declare, right, that it's illegal to collude in the mechanism, and then you basically kick the can down the road to whatever legal system you have for sort of enforcing your rules. And, you know, even putting that aside, I mean, even if you do worry about collusion between different participants in an auction, traditionally, maybe you usually don't, you might usually don't, you would never be thinking about collusion between sort of participants in the mechanism and the person running the mechanism at the same time. That's just, I mean, that's just never been an issue in the, in the very traditional mechanism design settings. Whereas here, you know, a block producer and sort of submitters of transactions, they can certainly collude. And as we'll talk about, there are certain formats that are ruled out <clears throat> because they would be so vulnerable to that, that type of collusion, okay? So these are what make mechanism design for the blockchain hard and, you know, to someone like me, extremely interesting uh, scientifically. Now, you can also ask the question, <clears throat> are there any sort of unique benefits that the blockchain setting offers. So, so sort of additional levers we have in our design space that we're maybe not totally used to. And there are, and there's two that are, that are important for EIP 1559. So the first benefit is that, you know, it's not like this auction just happens once, right? It's not like a big spectrum auction, you know, where there's not gonna be another one in two years or something like that. Like clockwork, every 13 seconds, there's going to be another sort of auction for space in the current block. So what that means is, there's a, and, and of course, the, the outcomes of all of the uh, previous blocks are just part of the public record. <laughs> so there's a tremendous opportunity for a mechanism design, for a mechanism to take advantage in some way of the past, okay, meaning auctions that already took place for previous blocks in the longest chain to in some way influence the way you run the mechanism right now for the current block. And maybe the most natural idea here, which is what the IP 1559 uses, is a, is a type of reserve price that's a function of what's happened in the past. The second thing, which is sort of unusual, <clears throat> is in the blockchain setting, is how you have such uh, programmatic control over the flow of payments. So a user submits sort of a transaction fee, they sort of pony up, you know, some, crypt some cryptocurrency, you know, to cover what they said they're willing to pay. And then really it's the protocol that handles where that money goes, okay? And so in particular, you know, traditionally, you know, um, with first price auctions, that revenue would just be given to the block producer, which is natural enough, but that's programmatic and you can change the program and you can redirect it elsewhere. And as I'm sure most of you know, EFP 1559 indeed directs <clears throat> all of the revenue from the reserve price, um, actually redirects it into the sort of the dev null. Okay, so it just, it just sort of burns those transaction fees. So that's what makes, so these are the, the, the challenges and the benefits that make sort of mechanism design for sort of blockchain, especially at layer one, really a fundamentally different design problem than people have thought about for the last 50 years, okay? So it's really great opportunity for mechanism designers. All right, so now, okay, there we go. So what I wanna do next, and I, I sort of debated how much to, um, talk through EIP 1559, because uh, I know there's some real experts out there. And, but I decided to err on the side of accessibility. Um, you know, I want, I want the talk, you know, for, I want people who don't have much exposure to this, I want the talk to still be um, kind of very accessible. Also, I noticed that there are, I believe, three other talks on EIP 1559 today, um, all of which are, are after this talk, none of which have happened before. So maybe I can also sort of save the, the later speakers a little bit of effort if I just sort of give a thorough um, review. Also, frankly, it's just like a super cool design. So it's also, it's fun for me to talk about. I hope it's fun for you to, for, for you to listen about too, even if you more or less know all of the following. Okay, so recap, EIP 1559, I'm just gonna really basically follow, you know, Vitalik's original um, design for this transaction fee mechanism. And again, just for context, 
what existed before the IP1559 was a first price auction that was really just copy and pasted from Bitcoin, where it's kind of the most natural thing to do. You know, users, you submit a transaction, you include a bid. If your transaction gets included in a block, that bid gets transferred to the producer of that block. Okay, so that's what came before first price auction. The IP1559, frankly, is radically different, okay? It makes multiple changes all at the same time, and they're closely interlocking, okay? Really, you, if you made a subset of these changes, you would not get a good transaction fee mechanism. So you really need to make this kind of global move in the sort of landscape of transaction fee designs to get the, to get the new properties. So three, three main ideas. Main idea number one is a reserve price, okay? Which in this context, we will call a base fee. <clears throat> but it serves the role of reserve price in the sense that transactions unwilling to pay the base fee are just ineligible for inclusion in the block. They'll be regarded as an invalid transaction okay, if, you try to, if you try to include them in the block. This base fee is very important that it can't be manipulated by the current block producer. So the base fee is going to be a deterministic function of all of the previous blocks that have happened. And so this is exactly where, so right out of the gate, the mechanism uses this unique advantage of the blockchain setting where you have all this public history, which can inform how you run the mechanism. First price auctions, notice, do not take advantage of that. First price auctions, it's just literally every single block is the same. You just sort of have users sort of pay whatever they've bid. So that's so right out of the gate. It's, it's really interesting in that it's using that advantage of the blockchain setting. Okay, um, good. So now a couple questions that we need to answer. That's fine. So it's fine to say there's a reserve price. If the, reserve, you know, if the base fee is 100 GUE, any, any transaction that is less than 100 GUE per unit of gas is not gonna be, not gonna be included. So you know, the people who are included are going to be paying the base fee. So there's a question of where do those revenues go? Then maybe the even more obvious question is like, how is that base fee going to be set? How exactly is it going to be computed? <clears throat> and so one thing, uh, I, I guess actually, let me, let me back up a second, right? So, so why have a base fee? Like, where does this come from? Well, there's this, there's this sort of notion in a mechanism design of a truthful auction. Okay? And this is sort of what the second price auction has. And in a truthful auction, basically, it's just totally obvious as a participant what you should do. So truthful auctions completely minimize the cognitive burden of participating in the mechanism. Okay, so basically, you just sort of figure out what would be the maximum you're willing to pay, and you declare it, and you're done. Or sort of a different version is like a posted price mechanism, um, which is, is like shopping on Amazon, right? So like if you go and you think about buying a book or whatever, the book's 40 bucks, either buy it or don't, to so take it or leave it offer. You, know, you just have to decide, is your willingness to pay for this $40 or above? And in any case, it's clear what you should do. If the answer is yes, buy the book. If the answer is no, don't buy the book. So you know, participating in a first price auction is not like that. You're trying to be included, but you're trying to be included, you know, you're trying to pay as little as possible subjects to inclusion, which means there's a big cognitive burden on you or on your wallet, as the case may be, which is to figure, you know, to try to reason about what your competitors are bidding. Right? So you need to know what your competitors are bidding to know the minimum bid you yourself will be able to get away with and still be included. Okay? So bidding in first price auctions is hard. Okay? We've known that for a half century, supported by lots of experiments. You know, and you know, there's nothing about the blockchain setting that makes first price auctions any easier to participate in. Right? Wallets can try to suggest transaction fees, but they make mistakes because it's just a hard problem. Demand is changing quickly, et cetera. So the idea of the base fee is like, well, wouldn't it be nice if you know, Ethereum, like if sort of the consensus layer actually just suggested to you a posted price, just like you were looking at a book in, uh, on Amazon. So if it just told you, look, the current base fee is 60 GUE, take it or leave it. Okay, so if you're willing to pay it, you know, you're know, going to be included, don't worry about it. If you're not willing to pay it, sorry, we don't have room for you. Maybe sort of wait a little while and hopefully the base fee goes down in the future. Okay. So that's where this base fee comes from. You want to make this sort of um, experience of figuring out the appropriate bid as trivial as possible. Okay, so it's kind of a, a UX or user experience motivation in that sense. Right? What's super interesting is that even you know coming just purely from that motivation, coming purely from the motivation of wanting to help um, bidding be easy, you game theoretically arrive at the conclusion that you have to do something different with revenue than you were doing before. The obvious first thought, you know, as far as where do the base fee revenues go would be, well, why not to the black producer, right? That's always where transaction fees have gone. But if you try to do that, if you pass base <coughs> fee revenues through to a black producer, actually because of that same collusion that we talked about earlier, this sort of 
you know, non-standard collusion you can have between users of a mechanism and the person running the mechanism, that type of collusion can be used to circumvent a reserve price if the, if the revenues are generated um, are passed on to the block producer. Right, so basically if the current base fee is 100 guay and there's somebody who wants to be included but only wants to pay 50 guay, basically the block producer can say, hey, you know, go ahead and bid 100 guay on chain so that you're eligible and I'll refund you 50 guay per unit of gas off chain. And then it's basically like there's no reserve price at all, okay? So, you know, the, as many of you know, the way EFP 1559 works is it actually burns all of the revenue generated by the base fee. And the game theory does not dictate burning it, it, but it does dictate it cannot go to the producer of that block. So it has to be redirected in some way. Okay, so for example, by burning it, for example, by paying it forward to minus future blocks, for example, by redirection into, into a treasury. All of those sort of are, are game theoretically fine, all right? But you know, just, even com just coming from this goal of wanting a really uh, seamless bidding experience, you find yourself actually taking advantage of the programmatic control you have over payments Remember, that was the second benefit we talked about. So you, you find yourself needing that second benefit of the blockchain setting um, in order to you know, have good game theoretic properties, okay? uh, really for, for the base fee to be economically meaningful. Okay, so that's, so that the first question on the base fee was where does it go? And so it needs to go somewhere other than the block producer, for example, burning it. <clears throat> second question is how is the base fee computed? And probably the most obvious idea is just to have it, well, you know, let's kind of adjust it over time based on demand, okay? Right, if it seems like, you know, not that many people are willing to pay the current base fee, like I guess it's too high, so we should lower it. If it seems like there's a glut of people willing to pay the current base fee, I guess it's too low and we should increase it. <laughs> so that's a really natural idea. Um, but the question in the blockchain setting now is how do you know whether demand is sort of too high or too low or whatever? I guess you would know if the base fee was too high, right? Because then very few transactions would be eligible and you'd have a block that was not very full, right? So maybe only 5 million gas worth of transactions are willing to pay a base fee of 100, whereas meanwhile you have 15 million gas to work with. You're like, oh, I guess we really should kind of uh, decrease the base fee so that more people are eligible. <laughs> the problem, um, at least with the original sort of um, protocol design of just having fixed size 15 million gas blocks, is if you see a block which is full, you don't have any signal over whether the base fee is exactly right <clears throat> or whether it's too low. In other words, you don't know how much excess demand above and beyond the 15 million packed in the block there is. And, and you really need to know that information to know whether you should keep the base fee the same or whether you should increase it to reduce demand. So the way this is solved is through variable size blocks. So this is the second <clears throat> big idea in the mechanism. So now instead of 15 million being a hard cap uh, on a per block basis, it's more of a, it's more of a constraint in an amortized sense and a long-term average sense. So blocks are now uh, available to go up to 2X, up to 30 million gas. You could imagine using um, factors other than 2X, but the current design is 2X. And now you just use previous block sizes as your on-chain signal about <laughs> whether your base fee is too high or too low. If you see a block smaller than your target, you conclude the base fee is too high and you reduce it. If you see a block size which is too big, meaning more than 15 million gas, uh, then um, you conclude that the base fee is too low and you increase it. Okay. There's also um, some really neat, I mean, you could imagine having variable size blocks without any of the other stuff in some way. Because um, they do have uh, a bunch of other um, uh, really nice consequences. And the empirical analysis you'll be hearing um, immediately after this talk, this very nice work by um, Fan and uh, Lu Yao, uh, does a very nice empirical study of exactly these topics, and, and as well as a number of other things. So you should absolutely stay and watch that, uh, watch that talk right after this one. OK, so those are two, those are two of the three ideas. Um, for idea number three, let me point out a couple other questions you probably should have. <clears throat> so one question is, well, wait a minute. If all the transaction fees are just being burned and not going to the miner at all, right, the block reward is independent of the contents of a block. So like as a block producer, why would I not just mine empty blocks okay, if there's no actual payment for including transactions? So that's an issue. The second thing you should be wondering is, well, what if actually you know, the base fee, you know, what if the base fee is so low 
that not only is there not room in 15 million gas for all of the eligible transactions, but there's not even room with a double full block of 30 million gas for all of the eligible transactions. Okay, your base fee is just way off. It's just way too low. Then you're back in the sort of canonical conundrum where you don't have enough space for everybody eligible. You have to somehow decide between the, the people competing for that 30 million gas. So the third example, uh, the third key idea is known here as TIPS. I just call it sort of an, an emergency backup first price auction. Um, so the mechanics are is that as a user, you know, on the one hand, you're going to be paying the base fee, the base fee will be burned, but there's also a user specified tip. So this plays the previous role of the bid. So a user specified tip that a user is willing to pay up above and beyond the base fee. And this tip, that all gets transferred to the miner. Okay. And so the, the hope is that in terms of normal operation, okay, where sort of demand has been fairly steady and the base fee is kind of like stabilized so that there's typically roughly 15 million gas of eligible transactions for each block. At that point, you know, this first price auction is literally just used to give block producers the minimal incentive to not leave the block empty. And so that's gonna be some, you know, non-zero but nominal amount. So maybe like two to three guay, you know, would be a typical tip. If, if, you're in, if you're in a period where you have a relatively stable um, base fee. There are gonna be these exceptional situations, right? Like if there's suddenly like, you know, a new NFT mint or whatever, and demand suddenly goes up super high. I mean, the base fee only adjusts gradually. It only can, it, it only can go up or down so much from block to block. So if there's a super sudden spike in demand, there will be this transitory period where it takes a little while for the base fee to catch up to the new demand level. And so in that transitory period, you still got to allocate block space. And so this emergency backup first price auction is basically how that allocation happens in these what should be rather rare um, intervals of so, so sort of sudden demand shocks. <laughs> All right, good. So that's, that's the review uh, of EFP 1559. So again, the three big ideas are there's, there's a base fee acts as a reserve price. Um, Game theory says that the base fee revenues cannot go to the block producer. In EIP 1559, uh, the choice was to burn them, in effect, give a sort of, um, in effect, pass them on pro rata to holders of the Ethereum currency. <clears throat> you need to adjust the base fee because demand goes up and down. The way you track demand going up and down is through this trick with variable size blocks. So you have a target block size. You know, large blocks indicate a low base fee, small blocks indicate an overly high base fee. Um, and then you have this emergency backup sort of first price auction, um, you know, just uh, to handle these cases of these of these sudden these sudden demand shocks. Okay. So that's EIP 1559. That that is is really you know basically just Vitalik's original design. So you know, so I did some work trying to really, um, you know, take take the understanding that the Ethereum community, I think, really already had of EIP-1559, but really making it precise and formal and mathematical, so really having mathematical definitions and mathematical theorems, which basically, um, you know, I think of it as, as really kind of justifying the design and also justifying the Ethereum community's um, sort of intuition about why the design was a good design. Okay, I think this, this is a real, I think, testament to the Ethereum community that that I really think um, most, you know, pretty much all of the main issues you might have with this mechanism were, I think, anticipated um, by the core builders in Ethereum who were, who, who, you know, had been talking and discussing this for, for a couple of years. Okay? I really think uh, the understanding was very good. It was very good. Um, all right. So basically three types of guarantees. And so again, let me, let me sort of just review briefly when I talked about sort of the challenges of mechanism design in the blockchain setting. Right, so we had the old non-unique challenge, which is you, you know, you, you'd like, which is you, you know, a mechanism can be manipulated by its users through the misrepresentation of preferences, which in our context means uh, sort of a false bid, a bid other than your maximum value. So that's sort of the first guarantee we would like: robustness to manipulations by users or a truthful mechanism. That's the standard one. But then we have the two sort of totally new types of guarantees. Okay. Um, the first one is just remember that miners have dictatorial or block producers have dictatorial control over you know, what's in their blocks, both as far as what transactions are included, which ones are excluded, and also they can insert their own fake transactions if they want. This is the reason why second price auctions are just a complete non-starter kind of in the blockchain setting. Um, and so you know, as part of my work, I sort of defined a notion of myopic minor incentive compatibility or MMIC which analogous to how truthfulness says you wanna be robust to manipulations by users, 
This MMIC condition says you'd want to be robust to manipulations by block producers. Okay, so that's the first really new definition, new type of incentive compatibility guarantee, which is, as far as I know, had not been considered previously. And then the other sort of really new challenge is collusion between, you know, not just participants with each other, but also between participants with the person actually running the mechanism, with the, with the actual um, block producer. So there, uh, there's another sort of new mathematical definition um, that I gave, which I called OCA proofness. OCA here stands for off-chain agreement. You know, and again, just like truthfulness says you want to be robust to manipulations by users, just like MMIC says you want to be robust to manipulations by miners or block producers, OCA proofness says you want to be robust to manipulations by cartels um, of users and block producers. Okay, so those are the three types of, of manipula uh, manipulations we want to argue are sort of of no benefit. So there's no point to any of these parties actually engaging in these kinds of uh, funny games. Okay, And I guess... Um, let me also just mention, right, I mean, just to take a step back a little bit, I mean, wh what we're seeing, what we're in the middle of seeing happening, which is really, really cool, is we're seeing how designs that were really invented in the sort of Ethereum trenches, right, really by people building this protocol, trying to solve real problems, we are seeing how the ideas that arose in the trenches, you know, are becoming things, you know, are, become, are going to becoming standard notions you know, that academics and researchers really think about, right? So in the papers I've written, right? So I've, I've sort of made these definitions, I've made them in a way so that other researchers can use them and build on them. And you know, it's slow, you know, things go slow in academia, but I mean, this is actually happening relatively rapidly as academia goes, where we're seeing, you know, all of these um, sort of issues that were really, you know, kind of articulated by the Ethereum community, you know, around around sort of the EIP 1559 discussion, we're seeing those become, you know, really, um, Formal concepts that you know that that uh, uh, an academic research literature is going to be built around over the next several years. So that's just that's just sort of a really cool thing. We're really seeing kind of the the practice um, influence just kind of the, the the academic research, which is which is really cool. All right, so back to EIP fifteen fifty nine and these three kinds of guarantees, right? Robustness to manipulation by users, robustness to manipulation by miners, robustness to cartels. Um, so the good news is, is it has complete robustness against uh, the latter two things. Okay, so in fact, because base fee revenues cannot be manipulated um, by the by the producer of the current block, and because those base fee revenues um, are burned, and be, uh, it is the case that mine, that block producers have no incentive to deviate from their intended behavior in EIP fifteen fifty nine. The expected behavior of a miner is just to pack a block as full as possible with eligible transactions. Uh, in a way that maximizes their tip revenue. Okay, and so that's that's exactly what block producers are in fact incentivized to do. So that's great. Um, and then it's also OCA proof, so it's also robust to collusions between um, miners and users. And for this to be true, it's totally crucial um, that the base fee revenues are burned. Okay, otherwise, you, as we discussed, you would um, actually be manipulatable by by cartels of this form. Another fun fact is that if you if you were someone who was just like a, a, a big fan of the burning aspect of EIP fifteen fifty nine, you just really sort of you know you cared about you know sort of so called ultrasound money, but nothing else. Um, your first thought might be let's just keep the first price revenue, but actually burn some fraction of the revenue that it generates. Uh, that also fails miserably, and it fails miserably for the same reason because cartels of uh, block producers and users can actually basically you know steal money from the protocol and keep it from themselves. So really, you know, the 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 two biggest you know things about um, EIP fifteen fifty nine, the ease of fee fee estimation offered by the base fee, you know, and the kind of you know reduction in inflation caused by fee burning, you can't have one without the other. They're really inextricably linked in a game theoretic sense. Okay, so that's just sort of worth uh, worth remembering. All right, so that's great. Um, and now the final thing: what about the traditional goal? Uh, of truthfulness, where it should be sort of trivial for participants to sort of figure out how to bid. And here EIP 1559 isn't perfect, but it's it's still very good. So I mentioned when I talked about TIPS, the emergency backup first price auction, that basically it should play effectively no role, um, except in these transitory periods uh, where you have these sudden demand shocks and the base fee is just way too low and, and needs some time to sort of catch up. And indeed you can prove a theorem which says, unless you're in one of those weird transitory periods, where the base fee is just like crazy low, unless you're in one of those sort of, um, you know, uh, demand shock periods. In fact, it is obvious to figure out how you should bid 
um, in EIP 1559. Okay, so there's two parameters you have to set as a user. You have to set the tip and you have to set a fee cap. Fee cap is just the maximum you're willing to pay overall between the base fee and the tip combined. And so the obvious bid is you set the fee cap to your maximum willingness to, cap, to pay, which would be sort of your bid in a second price auction, if you can run a second price auction, sort of same idea. Uh, and then the tip should just be whatever minimal nominal amount is, is sort of necessary to, to encourage miners to include a transaction as opposed to leaving the block empty. And again, two to three GUE seems like um, sort of a reasonable uh, amount for that tip, okay? And um, so just to sort of you know, recap the report card, so the status quo had been first price auctions, which on the one, like conceptually were sort of unsatisfying because they made no use of the idiosyncratic advantages of the blockchain setting. Um, they were robust to manipulations by block producers and by cartels, so that was good, but they're just, it's very cognitively diff difficult to figure out how to bid in them, right? So there, there's never a situation in which it's easy to figure out how you should bid in a first price auction. Okay? It doesn't matter if demand is stable or not, it's never, it's really just never easy to figure out what you should be bidding. And so EIP 1559 in making this big set of couple of changes, it retains the robustness to miners and robustness to cartels. It, it has those properties for quite different reasons than a first price option, but it does have both of those two properties. And also in com, you know, under in normal operation, you also have that third property that we really want, that we had a truthful mechanism where there's an obvious bid that's kind of trivial to figure out you know, what you should, how you should participate in that, in that first price option. There is this usually qualifier, because again, you lose the truthfulness condition if there's a sudden demand shock. And then the, the design is also sort of very um, satisfying in that it really does take advantage of the two um, sort of things we had going for us in the blockchain setting. It heavily uses the past, that's in order to tune the base fee over time. Um, and then it heavily uses the programmatic control over, over where um, transaction fee revenue goes. As we saw, we, we, it really needed to be burned or otherwise withheld from the, <clears throat> from the blocks producer. Uh, in, in my work, I've also pointed out a variation of the mechanism, which I like to call the tipless mechanism. And this is basically where you replace um, the tipping system just with a hard-coded tip that goes from the you know, submitter of a transaction to the producer of that block. And if you do that, then if you if you look at the EIP 1559 report card, it moves the usually from the third term to the second term. Okay, so it's also always robust to minor to block producer manipulation for the tipless variants. Okay, where it's not user specified, where it's hard coded in the protocol what the minor tip is. It's actually always truthful. Doesn't matter whether or not you're in a, a time of, a, of demand shock. But in a time of demand shock, you do lose this robustness to cartels. You do lose OCA proofness, you know, not in normal operating conditions, but in these transitory periods, um, that's where you sort of pay the price instead. So those are two mechanisms that you might think are on, you know, you might speculate that they're on the Pareto frontier in the sense that they get, they almost get all three properties. There's one property they once in a while won't have, and those two mechanisms sort of choose different guarantees for which one to give up on in these sort of unusual demand shock periods. But you know, any, any good builder and any good researcher, you're, you're greedy, you always want more, right? Whatever you prove for some mechanism, you wanna know is there a better mechanism that has even better properties. Like we have these three things we want, why, you know, let, why, let's have it all. Like let's have all three properties all the time. And so I wanted to advertise a kind of very exciting theoretical result uh, by Hao Chung and Elaine Shi at CMU uh, this I notice is not on, on the program today, which is too bad because this is a really, really nice paper. Um, and among many other things, they prove formally <clears throat> an impossibility result, okay, showing that there literally does not exist. All right. So 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 the reason we have these all these usuallys is not because you know, you know, the community hasn't been smart enough, it's because it's fundamentally impossible to not make those compromises. There literally does not exist in a mathematical sense, okay? there does not exist a transaction fee mechanism that always in all cases has all three of those guarantees, robustness to users, robustness to block producers, and robustness to cartels. So compromises like the type that we see in EIP 1559 or the tipless variant that I mentioned, they are inevitable, they are provably necessary, okay? So uh, this paper is on archive, I encourage you to check it out. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really nice work. All right, so this is my last slide. Let me just say a little bit about open directions, which then could segue <laughs> perhaps into the, into the Q&A session. 
Um, so what, what is there to be done? Well, there's a lot to be done. Pretty much, no matter where you look in the blockchain world, there's just an enormous amount of hard and important work that still needs to happen. Um, so one thing I didn't talk about at all is the formula by which the base fee is increased or decreased if the recent blocks have been too big or too small, respectively. And so the EIP 1559 spec, it has, a, it has a specific formula that's used. So basically it's a max change of 12.5% in either direction. And you just sort of linearly interpolate depending on how the block size compares to the target of 15 million gas. Uh, you know, I think everybody would agree that, that that's fairly arbitrary. I mean, I think it's a perfectly natural sort of place to start. Uh, it's not, I, I wouldn't have necessarily launched um, the mechanism with anything different. But I also think it's clear that, you know, the community should refine our understanding of this choice over time. And in particular, maybe tweak it a little bit. One thing I'm very interesting to see how it plays out. So, I mean, if you look at the, you know, you can find these charts about the evolution of the base fee over time, and it's a little choppy, okay? It's, it's kind of thing I think maybe a priori one might have hoped for or expected a little bit of a smoother kind of evolution of the base fee. Whereas, you, you know, you see these 12 and percent jumps actually fairly frequently. Now, what I'm super curious, so, so something I'm super curious about, and once the merge happens, I'll know my answer. Okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm very excited to see how this plays out. One conjecture would be that the, re, the, the, the primary cause for the current choppiness and base fee evolution is in fact the uh, variability in time between consecutive blocks, right? And this is really a consequence of the proof of work civil resistance um, that, uh, you know, that the original Ethereum has always used, right? It's a Poisson process, um, you know, for who, so for when sort of a, a crypto puzzle gets solved and someone gets to publish a new block. And so while it's tuned so that on average, you'll see a block every 13 seconds, you know, sometimes you'll see two in rapid succession, sometimes like pretty frequently, there'll be a 30 second gap um, between consecutive blocks. And if there's a really long gap between consecutive blocks, well, in the meantime, even if demand is normal, a ton of transactions may have come in, and so all of a sudden you're gonna have this like super big block after 30 seconds in effect making up for the fact that you were missing a block 13 seconds ago. And so it's unclear to me right now whether the, the choppiness in the base fee evolution is primarily caused by variability in block production uh, or if there's really sort of an issue with the update rule. Um, so with the, with the merge going to proof of stake, there you're gonna have fairly regular block production. Okay, it's gonna be basically once every 12 seconds. You know, you will have people missing their slot, presumably once in a while. So that'll lead to sort of the similar bursts. Um, but I could, I could easily imagine that things will smooth out automatically post-merge. If they don't, I think then that would be a really interesting th thing to, to iterate on. Okay, so next, next open direction. This is something I talk about actually at, at length in my, in my long public report about EIP 1559, <clears throat> which is sort of understanding the prospects of long-term collusion by block producers. Like you might be worried about block producers you know, keeping the base fee low um, over time by sort of publishing sort of smaller blocks periodically than they, than they should. And so in, in my paper, I draw an analogy to sort of sustaining collusion in the, in the repeated prisoner's dilemma. Um, but it's fairly anecdotal, I would say, in my work. And it's really something which you should be able to have a formal game theoretic um, analysis around. And so I'd really love to see someone, someone carry that out. I'm very excited about the development this year around multi-dimensional EIP 1559. Um, oh, I should have said on the, on, on the first point, on the, on the point of the update rules, there's a talk in the afternoon, um, you know, a little bit later by Stefanos Leonardos. And so that's a good place to, to sort of get an intro to dynamics around the, the base fee update rule. Um, that, that's sort of one of the main points of that talk. Multi-dimensional EIP 1559, that again, there's a talk later today um, by Ansgar Dietrich. Um, and this is definitely, I think this is, I think this is a really um, natural and interesting evolution of sort of the basic EIP 1559, the sort of, you know, where you have multiple resources that you're trying to price at the same time. I think there's really interesting theoretical questions about, you know, to what extent should the different dimensions interact with each other? Um, as soon as I get a little bit of free time, I'm definitely planning on spending some time thinking about this. I think this is a really nice, really nice direction. And now just to tie this back to sort of slide number one, where I tried to sort of situate, you know, this, this sort of work in Ethereum transaction fee mechanism design, you know, in the broader mechanism design context, you know, I, I do think, you know, so, so transaction fee mechanisms have been a great excuse to really drill down and think hard about what should a theory of mechanism design look like at the consensus layer, okay? 
And I think some of what we've learned is specific to it being layer one, to it being the consensus layer. Some of what we learned, I think, is true much more broadly up and down the stack. Okay, and so I think you know, moving forward over the next you know year or two, I would I would love to see you know many people thinking seriously about mechanism design higher up the stack. All right, so for example, interactions between uh, layer twos and layer ones. Right, so Barnaby actually Barnaby Minot just had a nice write up about, about the economics of, L2, of layer twos a few weeks ago. I would encourage you to start there, um, to, start, to start reading about how the, how the two layers might interact. You know, for example, you know, layer two is gonna be responsible for sort of um, paying for call data published at layer one, and sort of how should that be handled kind of inside the, the way pricing is done at layer two? Really interesting question, I think. Um, and then there's no question at the application layer, Right, there's just tons of tons of opportunities for mechanism design. This whole lot, but for example, some of the issues at layer one percolate up, right? This idea of kind of you know um, block producers sort of manipulating the allocation. That it's basically the same issue that manifests itself you know differently at the application layer through what we call MEV through through extraction of value by by block producers. Um, so those are all, you know, this, just an enormous amount of work to do in mechanism design, both specific to Ethereum and I think, you know, uh, you know, because, you know, the problems that are arising in Ethereum are also sort of so fundamental. They're also sort of, they're, they're forcing us to kind of come up with solutions, to come up with mathematical definitions that are relevant kind of, you know, much beyond Ethereum. Um, certainly to other blockchains, but even, even perhaps more broadly than that. So that's, that's a big part of the reason why I'm, I'm, um, having a lot of fun, just spending a lot of time thinking about mechanism design uh, in this context. So let me wrap up there. Um, this way we have a good 10 minutes um, for Q&A. Uh, and again, let me apologize for not being there in person. I would have loved to meet so many people I know only from Twitter. I would have loved to meet you in person. Um, but, you know, we do what we can given the circumstances. So I'll stop there. Happy to take questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tim, for the very nice talk. I think we're all meeting a lot of our Twitter friends for the first time as well. And <laughs> we, ho we hope you were here, but uh, yeah. next time. Uh, we'll have some time for questions. We have two microphones that are going around the room. I'll just raise, I see one here. Mm, hello. So on your slide, you say MFV aware mechanisms uh, designed at the apl application layer. Could you name like a hello world of that? Um, let's see. Well, there's a lot of this happening in sort of, um, I'd say in sort of, you know, research discussions, right? So, <clears throat> you know, like one example would be work done by, um, you know, Angaris and Chitra and Evans around basically, you know, having automated market makers in effect reshuffle the ordering around trades. Um, so if, you know, if you have access to reliable randomness um, at the consensus layer, then you can, you can play tricks where you basically make it much more difficult for block producers to figure out how an ordering of transactions would benefit them directly. So that's, you know, that's kind of an example of a specific solution. I mean, there's definitely other specific solutions that people are thinking about, like, you know, so-called fair ordering consensus. I'm not, I'm not aware of anything in production. Um, which I would really necessarily call this. Um, and I also think we just, we don't really have a, like we don't have a mathematical definition of what this means exactly. We have these couple examples, um, but I think we really, we need definite, you know, we don't yet have definition 1.1 about, you know, robustness at the application layer to block producer manipulation. I think that's doable. I just don't think it's been done yet. Okay, thank you very much. No, that's the question. Hi, Tim. Um, so other than transaction fee mechanisms and these uh, MEV aware mechanisms, are there any uh, other mechanism design stuff in blockchains and around blockchains that you've been looking into and find uh, interest in? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I've been thinking more about the application layer lately. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't have anything mind-blowing to report, but um, you know, when I see when I see like extremely poorly designed, you know, NFT drops, for example, right? Like, I just my Pavlovian response is to start thinking about like what's the right way to do this, for example. Um, 
I've thought a fair amount about AMM design, automated market makers, um, which, um, you know, just kind of like what, what, what would be a notion of optimality uh, for automated market makers? How would you argue that one choice of a trading curve would be different than another? Um, that's, you know, it's a slightly different problem. It's a little less about elicitation and, and it's more about, it's kind of a more um, narrow problem, but still it has the flavor of mechanism design. Um, so yeah, those are, those are some of the things I'm looking at, I would say. Like I said, I mean, some, you know, and even in putting together the slide, I was reminded that, you know, it would be fun to go back to the lower layers uh, for a little bit. I mean, I, again, I think the, the <clears throat> um, sort of pricing multiple resources at layer one, I think is a great question. And this L1, L2 interaction, I think is also a great question, but I haven't had a chance really to think about either of those very deeply so far. Hi, um, I wanted to ask something um, a bit beyond the scope of your talk, I guess, but um, I think uh, blockchains have a, a, a real image problem, and I'm aware that that is a, a problem that is, uh, persists across a lot of academia as well. So I'm really interested as an ac academic from established uh, academia background, um, is that changing? Um, what's your experience of all of that? Um, and uh, how should the community approach the, that problem, I guess? That's a great question. Um, yeah, this is exactly the kind of question why I thought it'd be good to leave a long Q and A thing for it. Because, um, so you're, I, I agree with you. I mean, it is. So let me, let's just say, like, I definitely wouldn't generalize. There's a wide range of opinions um, in academia, and sort of among academic researchers about this space. There's plenty of people that are big fans. There's plenty of people that are neutral. And as you say, there are plenty of people that are fairly hostile. Um, and in a way that I haven't necessarily had to deal with directly myself in my, in my previous work. So it is sort of a new aspect of the challenge. And certainly, you know, I view, you know, just because, you know, at this point, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm fairly senior and so on. So I do regard part of my responsibility as not just leading by research, you know, but also, you know, education, making sure people understand what does this technology actually do, um, you know, and just trying to, you know, you know, you know, focus on the image problem. So I, I actually, I am think I do think about this quite a bit. Um, let's see. So what, what concretely can I say? Oh, okay. Well, well, so here's, you asked if it's improving. I would say, I would, I would say what, what I'm really encouraged by is I'm seeing all of the foundations being laid which will inevitably lead to it to it improving. So like if you literally sampled computer science professors now versus 2020, I'm not sure you would have any more enthusiasm or any less hostility now than you did two years ago. So in that sense, I think there's still a lot of work to do. On the other hand, like, like honestly, like the number one thing which would really be a game changer is if, you know, is would be sort of breakthroughs at the application layer. Now, the breakthroughs at the application layer may require breakthroughs at the infrastructure layer, right? So you may need, for example, like, you know, great scalability solutions before you can really sort of enable what are going to be the sort of world-changing applications. But once we have those, you know, and it's not a foregone conclusion we will, but I personally do strongly believe that just, you know, the, the functionality you get from blockchains is sufficiently unique that there's no way that all of the smart people in the world are not going to figure out amazing things to do with it. That's, that's my belief. It's, you know, it's a belief, it's not a fact, but it's a belief. Um, and once we see those, you know, those big changing, um, you know, kind of applications where everybody knows what they are, everybody uses them, you know, everybody thinks their life is better, right? Because it exists. And they, they really wouldn't want to go back to a world of, you know, 2005 when, when th those options weren't available. You know, at that point, people become very willing to overlook the problems, right? Because, like, an analogy I keep going back to over and over and over again, but it's it's just it, it serves it just serves so well as the internet. So I I did this briefly at the beginning of my talk, right, where I said there's no there's very little mechanism design in the plumbing of the internet, whereas it's so cool that there is in the blockchain world. And <clears throat> honestly, so I don't know, you know, I don't know how old you are. I'm I'm 46, so. Like when I was in, I started using the internet in college in the mid nineties. Um, and I gotta tell you, like it was not, you, you could not really find non-nerds that had good things to say about the internet in the mid nineties. Um, I mean, you could sort of send emails, you could transfer files, static web pages had just, just been invented. 
you know, like if it ever showed up on a TV show, it would just be to sort of say how weird somebody was, you know, that they, that they use the internet. So, you know, but then it's, but like people, other people in my generation, like will probably claim to not even remember this era, right? Because at th- like at this point, any random person you pick on earth, they'd be like, oh my God, what would I do without the internet? It's like inconceivable, right? And so, I mean, I, so I think, so I think the, the hard version of your question is how do we work on the image problem before having the big breakthroughs of the application layer? Because honestly, I, I do feel like those may be, I, I don't think that's 2023 that we get the big breakthrough. I mean, we, we make progress toward it, I'm guessing, but I'm thinking more of five, even eight, or you know, even eight years or something before it's really obvious to almost everybody um, kind of what, what the applications are. So before that time, right, so, so my, my first part, my first answer to the question is long time frame, as long as the application stuff works itself out, which I believe it does, will, just seeing how many smart people are sort of working on this. I think it'll sort of take care of itself. Um, prior to that, I mean, the, the thing that I really try to hammer on, especially when I'm talking to sort of computer science researchers, and frankly, this, this, is, this is clearly going to have to hammer on this for a really long time. But somehow, every, you know, the, the, you know, it's sort of a testament to the power of first impressions, right? Because most people's first impression and second impression and third impression of this technology was kind of as, as a currency, right? And in some sense, you go back to the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, and it really did seem like it was part of their, like their primary motivation may have really been to have a digital currency that could seriously compete with fiat currencies. That may well have been Nakamoto's primary goal. And that really, um, and so this focus on, you know, cryptocurrency as currency has ever since really dominated the conversation. Um, and my view is that, you know, cryptocurrency, you know, you know, maybe cryptocurrency winds up challenging fiat currencies. I don't know, but, that is not a prerequisite for the massive success of this technology, of the complete takeover of, you know, the, of the internet by blockchain-enabled applications. You know, I mean, cryptocurrency, I mean, it's going to keep existing just because it's so convenient, like from an implementation perspective, like to have a native currency, like either in your L1, you know, or if you have sort of an application layer ecosystem, right, you want to sort of incentivize people to contribute and want to maybe charge for usage. You could imagine doing that, not in a native currency, but man, is it convenient to do it in a native currency. But it's very easy to imagine a world where everybody is using kind of Web3 applications. Um, nobody even knows there's a cryptocurrency under the hood, but there is a cryptocurrency, and that's what helps sort of make everything work, right? The same way that a typical user of the internet, you know, has no idea that, you know, there's congestion control, that there's some algorithm sort of controlling sort of how fast they can send traffic through the internet. They don't know that. They're just using the internet. And so I could imagine cryptocurrency in the end being totally under the hood. Or not, you know, you know, Bitcoin, obviously, it seems pretty stable as a store of value. It's really, I don't know if it's, I don't know if you call it a currency per se, but you'd certainly call it an asset um, in a very legitimate way. So I don't want to limit, um, you know, I, I don't want to limit the impact of blockchain technology just to applications where the currency part is hidden. But that, I think, is inevitable. I mean, that, that's, what I, that's what I'm kind of betting the farm on, right? That, that, you know, even if cryptocurrency fails in the sense of Nakamoto, still blockchain-enabled technology will take over the world. That, that I believe very strongly. As far as how much will it change kind of, you know, the way people do, you know, how will, how will it change kind of, you know, where people store their store value? That I think will be interesting to play out. I can see that going in a lot of different directions. So in the short term, what I'm really trying to do is when I talk to computer scientists, I try to, I try to get them to not think about, you know, digital currencies per se, and to think about the remarkable novel computing functionality that this technology enables. So I say, think of it as a computational model. Okay, In the implementation of this, this model, this virtual machine that lives on the internet, in the implementation, there may well be these currencies that you've heard about, but I do not want you to focus on that. I want you to focus on, this is, this is what the technology enables. What can we do with it? How can we make that as robust as possible? So how can we make the virtual machine sitting on top of the internet as fast and as kind of reliable as possible? And how can we take the functionality that it gives us and design really amazing things on top? So I have to say, it's very hard to get people to turn their attention away from the payment slash currency angle, but that's, that's what I'm trying very hard to do these days. Thanks for the question. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Tim. 
Uh, we won't have time for more questions, but thanks again for the talk. Let's give a round of applause to Tim. Thanks, everybody.